they would deliver like cakes and bread, that sort of thing. But this, uh, you uh, put in a lot of supplies for the winter because the winters were colder and more snow, yeah. and you didn't have anybody, uh, any way of getting provisions, so you had to take care of it ahead of time. Yeah. So you had that sort of thing in the those things in the house. No snow plows to plow you oh, out. Oh no, was not, nobody ever plowed us out. I used to snow. There were no snow plows. You walk to school on top of the drifts. The drifts would be frozen solid, and you walk right along on top of them up Chaplin Street, down Rhode Island Avenue to Cranston, right on the top of the of the drifts, and everybody shoveled his own sidewalk to give you a place to walk along. And but the rich people would go away in the winter time, so my father would shovel all the way along our and the next house and up Champlain Street until we got to Weaver's. And then Mr. Weaver would shovel from there up to Gibbs Avenue just for us. <laughs> but many a time we walked right on top of the stokers. My my fantasy is that life then was a lot slower. Simpler, simpler and simpler. slower. Mm -hmm. More family life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not as much out of the home entertainment. Very, very little. As far as we were concerned, didn't it? Uh, did you uh, ever join any civic organizations? Uh, we're looking at uh, not just when you lived on Eustace, but also uh, since the night, since 1940. Well, I, the Women's Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I was woman of the year, naturally, I got that. Oh, yes, when was that? That was 1974. Yes. And, uh, How did that come about that you. Because I, I headed the centennial of Rogers High School in 1973. Mm -hmm. What I have done, they made me look at the year. Uh, civic organizations or community organizations. You're kind of young. You're kind of young back in World War One. But were you in anything to do? With Plus, well, I was only in high school, mm -hmm. and in high school, you didn't join many. We tried Red Cross, cross that sort of thing. But in high school in my day, uh, the spirit of the World War One, we had very two boys. One by one, they left the class and joined the Navy and joined the Army. Mm -hmm. We still had enough to have a five basketball game, though. <laughs> team, yes. We had an excellent basketball team. But we didn't have too many boys in our class. Because of the war, you mean? Because of the war, yes. Did they join the services? And of course, from that time on, you had a different opinion of the armed forces. Uh, because our own were sailors, and our own were soldiers. Before that, uh, you would not have to know. I'm down in Eustis Avenue. The sailors or the soldiers. We that's never right. came in contact with them. They were never down that way. Uh, right. But we did go every, not every, but many Wednesdays to the training station for the drill that used to be over there. We used to have a drill, sailors' drill over there. Mm -hmm. And we took the trolley car from Washington Square over. Over to the training station. Training station uh -huh. to see the drill. It's either Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon. And if you had company come from away, you always included that uh, during the, the visit. Uh, okay. Uh, that was sort of like what nowadays we would go to the mansions, uh, taking guests yes, to the mansions. Yes, yes. Then you'd often take guests to the Navy train station. But uh, the mansions, the people in the mansions, always meant a great deal to us. Oh. Because but, after all, uh, they employed so many people, uh -huh. the gardeners, the coachmen, and the servants in the house, 
opening the houses and closing the houses. And as, Mark, as far as we were concerned, we sold ace to them. Mm -hmm. So they were, we were interested in them because they brought quite a bit of money to us mm -hmm. with selling the rice because they would be buying a great deal more rice than the uh, townspeople would be buying. Uh, did you ever feel any discrimination or prejudice from them? Oh, no. 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 But, but we were always interested in them. Interested, yeah. Uh -huh. Always wanted to read about them and that sort of thing. Ah, I see, yeah. And uh, enjoyed being up on the avenue and seeing them going along with their beautiful coaches. Oh, oh that was quite a sight, wasn't that was it? That was a beautiful sight, yeah. Were you very interested in politics at that time? I know I your brother I, I, I never was interested in politics. Uh, I despised him. <laughs> it was your brother, I guess, brother. who was interested in Well, to sum it up, uh, how did you feel about living in Newport uh, at that time? At that time? Mm -hmm. You mean I used to tell you? Yes, ma'am. Well, I had not, I had not seen very much of the world to compare it. But I was very contented, very happy. But everything was just beautiful. I didn't have any longing for any place. I was very satisfied with everything. In fact, I had never seen a train until I was about fifteen years old. Is that right? <laughs> That's how close to Eustis Avenue I live. Oh, okay. uh, uh, was uh, you mean it wasn't until fifteen that you maybe took a, like one of the island trains off to? Oh no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I was at a picnic at Lawton's Valley, and down by the shore, the train went by. That was the first time I'd ever seen one, and I must have been about fifteen then, fourteen or fifteen. Uh, <laughs> what'd you think? Oh, oh train. <laughs> now today, a parents would have been taking their children over to to down to Long Wharf, for instance, or uh, to uh, Barbara Street to show them trains, or would have been taken about a train. But it, I suppose people who had plenty of money did those things in my day. But we didn't have that. We were not poor, but we, and of course, my father didn't believe in. And then he, he was for the home especially. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's interesting. I could tell you, this is still on there. Yes. Does that mean turn off? We're through. We're through? Mm -hmm. I could tell you a funny story about that. He okay. didn't leave. You know. Would, no, I'd like to. Okay. Would you like to t put it on the tape? Or would you rather not? I'll tell, take off, take it off. Okay. Put it out of the tape. Okay. To illustrate how closely we lived to Eustace Avenue as we grew up, my father didn't believe in going out nights, so that my mother never made any arrangements to go places. But she met a friend of hers coming home from church one Sunday, and she invited her to a 25th wedding anniversary up on Prairie Avenue, which is just two streets above Eustace. So my mother went home and asked my father, and he said no. Nothing doing. We don't go out at night. So she decided to assert herself. So she took my brother and sister, and I was a baby in arms, to the reception. When she came home, the door was locked. So she knocked, and my father came to the door and said, Only for the baby in your arms, you would not get into this house tonight. Wow, that's uh, that's strict, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, where were you born? I was born in Newport, Rhode Island, on Eustace Avenue, in 1901, August 5th. Whereabouts in Newport is Eustace Avenue? 
Houston's Avenue is in front of the big pond, which is opposite Easton's Beach. Uh, one end, Memorial Boulevard now, it was Old Bath Road. And the other end is Bliss Road. It was always Bliss Road. At the time you lived there, it had the name still of Eustace, I believe. It was always Eustace, as I knew it. Okay. Where were your parents born? My mother was born in Ireland, born in Plymouth, Ireland. My father was born in Newport, Rhode Island. Hmm. Do you know where he was born in Newport? A street. Uh huh. Well, I was. Enter a guess it was Bath Road because that's where the family home was. Right. But I'm not sure now uh, just when it, they moved there. But as far as I have ever heard, my grandfather and grandmother lived on Bath Road. And the house now has been moved back when they made uh, a wider street of Bath Road, they called it Memorial Boulevard. It was near uh, Edgar Court. Hmm. Okay. What was your father's occupation? He was originally a carpenter, but then in his early 20s, he joined his father and grandfather in the Newport Ice Company, hmm. and his uncle also, and they ran the Newport Ice Company, which had its uh, ice houses on Waterworks Road, now Ellery Road right next to the Newport pumping station, water station. Mm. And the barns where they kept the wagons and the horses was on Annadale Road, mm. near Merton Road. Mm. So that is why we lived on Eustace Avenue, it was midway between uh, mm. barns and mm. the ice house. And of course my father always went in the horse and buggy to work, never walked. That mu he must have worked for the company back in the 1890s. 80s. Yes, yes. I, w I couldn't tell you just what year he started with the company, but definitely in the 90s, because he was uh, working with them. Uh, in 89, because that's when he met my mother. Mm. And he went uh, to deliver ice one day, and he met her. At that home. Okay. So that so that's I know it was in the eighties he was working. That's right. Yes, nice business. But he did tell how doing carpentry work on houses on or stores on Bellevue Avenue on the roof where you could look off and see the people walking across the bay when it was frozen over, walking from Port Adams over. Yeah. It's been cold man, eh? <laughs> So he changed jobs from uh, working with the ice company to becoming a carpenter, and he was a carpenter most of Carpenter time. first of all. Carpenter first of all. First of all, he's a guy. That was his trade. Oh, I see. But then he uh, joined his father oh. and grandfather in the business. I see. Uh, and your mother's occupation, she was principally. She was a cook. A cook. Uh -huh. She was employed as a cook. Uh, a cook, yes. Outside the home? No, in a, in a home. She was a cook for a family. Oh. Uh, one particular family, or is she? The Bentley family, who was a. Um, uh, the city officer of the city of Newport. Hmm. Can't tell you now just exactly his office, but she worked for. Mrs. Benson, husband Mrs. Benson. So. And they lived on Man Avenue at the time. Oh. Uh, was she the principal cook or did yes. they have several? Yes. And a good one too. <laughs> uh, did your parents uh, apparently your your father did it, was he also a carpenter at the same time that he yes, was working yes, with the uh, yes. ice yes. And your your mom principally uh, worked uh, as a cook. 
Uh, but then also, of course, she had the responsibility of raising your children. Right. She also worked, I guess, within the home. Within the Although she didn't work out as a cook after she married. I see. She never worked out outside her home after she married, ever. Yeah. I have to change gears here. Then. <laughs> didn't do that at that time. How many brothers and sisters did you have? One brother and one sister. My brother was 11 years older than I, and my sister 9 years older than I. So you were the baby of the family? I was the baby. Oh, what sort of work uh, occupation did your brother and sister have? My brother was uh, clerk of the Supreme Court, Rhode Island, clerk of the Superior Court, Rhode Island. And my sister was a <coughs> seamstress. Uh, they lived here in Newport? Always lived in Newport. When you were growing up uh, in uh, on Eustace Avenue there, uh, what sort of things did your family enjoy uh, doing together? Sitting on the piazza in the summertime, uh, eating, eating alive with mosquitoes, <laughs> but enjoying the moon coming up and in the summertime, the heat lightning and the fireflies up over in the marsh across the street, mm -hmm. and just all of us sitting there in our rocking chairs, covered with uh, a blanket, each one with a blanket, so that we wouldn't be eaten too much by the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Of course, that ended by nine o'clock because we all went to bed by nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So your house faced uh, east faced of Pond. Faces the pond. And you, that was the principal thing that you do in the evening then throughout the summer. That's all. People didn't do too much in those days. Mm -hmm. They were they were not. Uh, uh, my mother and father were not people to be always out evenings. They were always home. Because as my brother grew older, he was in politics and he was out many evenings. Oh. But my sister and I stayed close to home. That's what you were supposed to do in those days. I see. Would you attend some of the, uh, the festivals or dances or well, in, in the evening time or during the day? Well, not until I got out of high school. Out of high school? But up to, up to that time, it would be only dances at the high school. Okay. There wouldn't be any others. Uh, before, well, let's say about the time you were in elementary and, and before high school, where did you play? Mostly in that neighborhood? Just there? right around the neighborhood. Very few people to play with. Children to play with. Hmm. Just one or two girls up around Gibbs Avenue and Hunter Avenue. Is that because yeah. there weren't too many houses at that time? All the houses down there belonged to the wealthy. The wealthy lived up on Gibbs Avenue and their estates went down to Eustace. Yeah. And from the, uh, Gibbs Avenue was just lawns down to Eustace across the street, in some cases, gardens, vegetable gardens for the individuals. So that uh, uh, there, there were no children around to play. There were elderly people. Next to us lived Mr. Pompili, who was a famous archaeologist. Mm. He spent the summers in Newport, all the winters in Newport and the summers in New Hampshire. He looked like Santa Claus. He had a beard way down below his chin. Mm -hmm. Very much like Santa Claus. He's a famous man. Mm -hmm. That was directly next to us. Uh -huh. in, in the uh, same, what is it, the same type of house that you lived in? You mentioned it was a cottage. It was originally a cottage connected with the Cliff Walk Hotel down on the cliffs. And it was moved up to the present location on Eustace Avenue along with the house next to it. I would assume maybe in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. My father bought it in 1892. Where it sits now, on Where Eustace? Where it sits now. Yes, Besides your parents, uh, brothers, sister, uh, did you have any uh, other family living in Newport? I guess your father's family? Oh, my father had, had many people in Newport. He had sisters and brother. And, and many of the Greens were related to him, of course. William O. Green's family were related. That's what they 
to the Kogos, King Kogos. Uh -huh. Did anyone live with you at that time? Or no. Any other relatives or any? No. So just, just your family at that time? Just three of us and my other brother. Uh, did your dad have any interest outside of the house and the family? Absolutely none. It was work and family? Work and come home. And what about your mother? Same. Except to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> And uh, Saturday afternoon, walk along Eustis, up Church Street, up uh, Catherine Street, down Church Street, along Thames, up the square, the Broadway, and home. Mm -hmm. And that's a long walk mm -hmm. and on the way by a couple of books, because that was always necessary for us to have books. We had hundreds and thousands of them. Mm -hmm. And then on Broadway, you stopped at Gladden's Ice Cream for chocolate ice cream. So then, home. My father didn't approve of anybody being out at night. There was no good in being out after dark. And that was also with your brother, for him too. He couldn't oh, no. Uh, when my brother became of age, he didn't. Uh, yeah. have any, that was he, had, he had free use of his time. But this is when we were all small. Could always be sure we were all at home. Mm -hmm. Up until like your brother was maybe 15 or 16. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, my brother had a lamp uh, lighting route to be before he was 15. So Would you understand that? What do you mean? And that lamp lighting, well, the, uh, you know the gas lights you see down from up, mm -hmm. those are all around the town, you had no electricity. Mm. And boys went around at four or five o'clock lighting those lamps. They had a, a stick with a, a match on the end of it, mm -hmm. ran it up and lighted the lamps. And then the policeman put them out in the morning because the policeman in those days used to walk the beats. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> That's right. I hadn't thought about that. Because he also had a paper route, which every boy had mm -hmm. delivery. The Daily News or the Boston or the Newport Herald. I don't think he ever did the Herald, it was always the Daily News. Hmm. Where'd you go to school? Went to Calvin Cranston on Cranston Avenue and hmm. Rogers High School and Bryan College in Providence. Hmm. That was for a degree in education? BCS, Bachelor of Commission Science. Hmm. A commercial science? What? I'm not familiar with that degree. Well, I taught shorthand, typewriting, office practice. I see. Bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. uh, business education type of course. Yeah. That's what we need. <laughs> Did you find your uh, school experience was pretty valuable here in Newport, uh, in Calvin? Calvin? Did you find your school experience was pretty... Uh, Wonderful. Uh, that was at Calvin Cranston, yeah, your first one? Yeah. Wonderful. Loved every bit of it. No complaints about anything. How was it that you decided on your occupation? Well, I would like to have had money enough to, to go to a four-year college and teach. I always wanted to be a teacher. Unfortunately, the ice company failed in 1911 or 12, and it was necessary for my brother to leave Brown University where he was going because of financial problems. So when I came out of high school in 1919, there wasn't too much money for me to go to college. So I commuted from Newport to Providence every day because that was cheaper, and that was the best way I got an education. Hmm. And in those days, a two-year college would get you into the business teaching at Rogers High School. Nice. You didn't have to be a four-year graduate. Uh -huh. And then later I did graduate studies to get the degree in BCS. I didn't get the degree at the end of two years of course. I did studies at Boston College and so forth. Hmm. Boston University. Hmm. 
19, 1920, uh, how did you commute to Providence State? By uh, the train, which was down at Mar Marlborough Street. We took the 815 train, Fall River, got out, went down out of the station at Fall River to a consolidated train to take me to Providence. And then we got into Providence, you went right across Exchange Place to Bryant College, which was on the third and fourth floors of Exchange Place. Mm. Mm. And in the afternoon, we repeated the process. Yeah, how long? Or you didn't have to go underneath to uh, to get the Boston train, you got to the same side. Oh. And you got back into Newton, what about, oh, quarter past five. Oh. And then walked. From there, Marlboro to use the same. So, about how long would it take to go one way from Newport to Providence? Maybe at 8.15 in the morning, you would be in Providence at quarter of nine. Wow. Pretty good time. Quarter of ten. Quarter of ten. About an hour. Yeah, quarter of ten. Half. Quarter of ten. Oh. Uh, you mentioned uh, your parents uh, going to church with your parents, I guess. Uh, Something in the walk. Is that what you yeah. mentioned? The walk. Yeah. What, what church did you go to? We went to St. Joseph's Church on Washington Square. It is where the theater is now. Oh, yes. yes. Jane Pickens Theater? Corner, corner of Clark Street. Yes. It was a Mount Zion Church before St. Joseph's had it. And then in 1912, we moved up to Broadway in the corner of Man Avenue. Oh. Okay, yes. Uh, so y'all went to church pretty regularly then, huh? Yeah. Oh, my father didn't. My father was not a Catholic. The rest of us went. Mm. Regularly. Definitely. Would you spend quite a bit of uh, time at church? Or was church just uh, Just the ordinary time of the Mass, uh -huh. and then uh, from September through June, perhaps, back on Sunday afternoon for Sunday school. What would you do on religious holidays? Christmas, Easter? Same as anybody else did. But went to Mass, of course, first of all. On the Matthew, our Christmas was the same as anybody else's Christmas was not made as much of as they do today. Uh, Chris, Christmas wasn't? Well, what I mean by that, people didn't get around. You didn't have automobiles to travel. Many people didn't have uh, horses or, or uh, buggies or carry-alls. And distances were long for walking. So you didn't have, if your family was small and not many relatives, you didn't have too many people coming with Christmas presents, or you're going with Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. That was a later thing in my life after I began to, be, to work mm -hmm. and make uh, friends and uh, exchange presents. Uh, it was true, uh, definitely just a family Christmas or a family Thanksgiving, just ourselves, nobody else, mm -hmm. or family Easter. Did the neighbors get together very much in, no. the, in your neighborhood? You said many of them were quite a bit older than yourself. They were right? older, and many of them were wealthy. And actually, uh -huh. we were not wealthy. Uh -huh. We did have an English woman next to us who was wealthy. Uh -huh. And then above us, above her on Champion Street, the three uh, Yankees, by the name of Weaver, three, three women and a man, all single and all old, and above us on Fifth Avenue, the McClellans lived, who was a tailor, and they came from. But there are very few people around to, to visit her at all. Who'd you end up playing with? Did you have any other uh, good friends at that time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
When sure. one development of having it down there, I used to say, I'm yes. sure other parts of it was, uh, would be different. But I, we did enjoy skating. When oh, the Eastern pond, pond. When the pond froze over, and that used to go, freeze over around Thanksgiving. And we, all that time we enjoyed skating. And uh, I can remember the year the dam broke. We had such a cold winter that the, when the ice broke up, it piled up on the dam along Waterworks Road and cut a great hole in it. Uh, it was in 1912, same time as the Titanic. Yes. And in April 1912. And the water came way up, halfway up the locks in front of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were sailing along in boats. And thus, we couldn't get over the ice house then. Unless you went over by a boat. <laughs> So most of the uh, children you played with were in school offices, were you? Yes, and they were younger than I, too. Let's see. Uh, you stated that uh, you... Th when were you married? I was married in 1938. 1938. It was pretty well. The year of the hurricane. Uh -huh. Remember that year. <laughs> <laughs> so you were pretty well established, I guess, in your field by the time oh, yes. you got married. I had taught married. 17 years uh -huh. before I got married. How did you meet your husband? At a dance. Uh -huh. uh. A school type dance? No, no. Not what the school did. It was in Newport. It was in Newport. Yeah. And what was your father, what was your husband's occupation? He was a torpedo station, he was a machinist, and eventually was supervisor in the milling department. And he, were, he was from the uh, Newport. Newport. How long did you live uh, in that neighborhood on Houston Street? I lived for uh, 40 years. 1902 to 1901 to 1940. And that was the time that you moved into this neighborhood. I moved here in 1940. That was, I guess, you and your husband had moved here. This was y'all's house? Yes. We lived the first a year and a half to live down on Eustace. Our house here was rented at the time. And we bought it. So we didn't move in here until January 1940. Uh, how would you describe your neighborhood uh, on Eustace Street uh, looking? Was it pretty much a, 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 I was going to ask a, a well, aristocratic? Because it was made up mostly of rich people. Uh -huh. they, they didn't uh, mingle with the common ordinary businessmen. Mm -hmm. so I would say it was an aristocratic neighborhood. Do you remember Eustace Street being paved? Was it paved at that time? Or was it, or was it? Oh, it wasn't paved at that time. At all that time, no, by any means. I, would, I couldn't tell you when, when it first became paved, as we see streets paved today. And you all had a horse and buggy, isn't it? Yeah, there was plenty of mud those days. Yeah. yeah. And your father had a horse and buggy yes. that he used for transportation? Yeah. Where would he keep the horse and buggy? Was there a barn he that came up? Yeah. And a carpenter shop too. Oh. Can you uh, describe uh, how you felt in, in your house? Did you in, enjoy your house? Oh, I loved it. Loved it dearly. Mm. What did you like about it? Oh, it was big. It had twelve rooms. And uh, well, it was a nice neighborhood. I guess I tried to be a little aristocrat too. <laughs> Did you uh, do you remember some of the uh, social events that were going on uh, at your house and when you were growing up, having people over for dinner or for tea? Very few. 
Probably because you said of the, uh, it was a, the, the split isolated. at that time. It was isolated mm -hmm. from the rest of well, I can recall people coming in for Sunday supper. That is coming to call as people called in those days in the Sunday afternoon and staying on for supper. Mm -hmm. Not having been invited ahead of time, I don't mean, mm -hmm. but enjoying my mother's cooking. Mm -hmm. her, her hot biscuits and various things. But uh, they would be just friends who would call on Sunday afternoon. What sort of changes did you see uh, in the uh, Houston Street neighborhood? Well, of course, it began to grow, uh, build up. More and more houses along the Houston oh, Street. Oh, th in the 30s, I would say. All along on the opposite side of the street, they began to build houses. You were on the uphill side, is that right? We were on the uphill. And there was nothing on the opposite side. It was all marshland, full of beautiful blue, purple violets. It's very. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, uh, they began to build. And during the First World War, Mr. Pompelli, who I mentioned, had war gardens in the lawn down from his house down to Eustace. Hmm. They had uh, about 100 foot square lots, and people could, they didn't have to pay for them, they could uh, just come and plant the gardens. And there were quite a few people planted war gardens down there. My father planted two of them oh. right near our house. And we had plenty of potatoes and all other kinds of vegetables. And quite a few people in Newport oh. had it too. And how were the gardens associated with World War One? World War One, well, that was to help the people get food. No, it was to yep. help get food. So they began to plant their own. Nice. And I, I did that. Plant their own. And they were cheaper. Yeah. And everybody tried to uh, plant a war garden, possibly find any place to do it. Yeah. It sounds like the majority of the people in your neighborhood then. Uh, uh, were not business people. They didn't work, no. as you said. They, they were not business. They, were, they didn't work. And these people that had war gardens came from different parts of the city. They didn't belong down our way at all. I see. They just did the land. They, they came in to use the land. They used the land. They didn't belong in that neighborhood. What would you say that uh, you liked uh, least about your neighborhood at that time growing up? I can't remember anything I loved like least. Yeah. I, I loved it. Yeah. it Sounds very pretty. It was, it, was, uh, it was pretty. You could look across the water at Middletown. Of course, Middletown was uh, all built up as it is today. With that, uh, the array of lights that you see today. And you saw the sun coming up over the water there, mm. and you could, it was a very short distance to walk down to the beach, and you heard the, the surf, you knew there was a big storm at sea, and you walked down to the end of the street to see the waves, mm. and my father would take the horse and buggy down there, and walk the horse along the, the sand, it was good for his feet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'd, you'd go down and gather uh, clams, but they, they were washed up on the shore. Yeah. It's a different life, of course, than today. Uh, How would you categorize it as different? In what in what ways was it different? Well, you had more things at home. You didn't have uh, frozen foods and uh, things of that sort. You had carrots and turnips and onions and uh, that sort of thing. If you cook them, and then in the summer you had peas and spring beans and the other things and beets, and you canned them for the winter. Mm -hmm. And if you had pears on the tree, you preserved them for the winter. So that I, I we had so many pears canned, I, I despise canned pears. Mm. And the same is true of spring beans because they were 
so plentiful. My mother canned string beans. <laughs> they came in very handy in the winter because everybody did that. They stored things in for the winter. But you couldn't get around. You know, you didn't have people delivering every day as you have today from the markets. And uh, you didn't have the big supermarkets that people have today so that you bought provisions maybe once a week and had them in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, any store you could deliver down there. Mm -hmm. That pushed me down on, on 10th Street, corner of Market Square. And then there was a store on Broadway. H.W. Smith delivered. Uh, this is uh, Sue Madden, uh, the interviewer for the Oral History Project of the Newport Historical Society. And I'm at 62 Washington Street, the uh, home of Esther Fisher Benson, who is uh, the narrator. And it's April 16, 1984. And we have been talking for uh, just a few minutes and gotten a few uh, basic pieces of information about uh, Mrs. Benson, and uh, so now we'll proceed with the uh, the first section of uh, the biographical interview, which uh, relates to the family. I'm going to be some of these questions are, are repetitious, but uh, uh, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, Mrs. Uh, let's see, your birth date was uh, uh, August 11th, 1908. Okay. And you were born in Philadelphia, yeah. which you mentioned. Now, your parents were born in Philadelphia also? My mother was born in New Jersey, but my father was born in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, and what was your father's occupation? My father was a superintendent of the factory of the Exide Battery Company, and later the head of the development and design department. Oh. And he worked there all his adult life. Okay. Now, I did find out his name was Edward Wanton, W-A-N-T-O-N Smith, and he, uh, he died in 1940. Now, when was he born? 1875. Okay. Um, so, he, was, he had this job virtually, I mean, with this company virtually. When, as soon as he got out of college. Oh. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And your mother was from New Jersey. Now, did she, did she have a, a job, or is that no? A, my mother yeah. didn't. She had gone to the Drexel Institute, so she had a degree. Oh, well, now that but was it, unusual. It was. Yeah. Yes. She uh, had six children and a big house and servants. You know the way people yeah, did. Yeah. Yeah. So that kept her busy. But she had a lot of activities when her children uh, got out of the home. She did a lot. She worked with the day nursery and she did a lot of sewing. <clears throat> for the during the war for the children in Europe and with the American Friends Service yeah. and so she was a busy person too. Um, were there any other volunteer activities outside the home that, that you can remember that your mother was My involved? My mother did. The Morton Street Danish Street, the American Friends Service Committee. I can't think of any. You know, she was down in Philadelphia, and I was up here, and I didn't know all of the sure parts yeah, of her life yeah. then. No, and, and when she went to Drexel, what was her? Uh, it was her what they major? called the home economics. Oh, they called it then. So she was a good dietitian and yeah, all that sort of yeah. thing. And when I was a girl, there were always people who would come to her for advice and things like the formula for the baby. And there was one time when there was a woman down the street whose baby had an awfully hard time, couldn't get the right food, and the woman said to my mother, I don't understand all these Italian children, babies, all their mothers give them is banana and olive oil. And look at them. My mother said, you go home and give your baby banana and olive oil. <laughs> and see how, how she blossoms. <laughs> What about what about your father? Was he involved in outside activities in My the community? Was, or? No, he wasn't. He was one of these men who has a workshop of his own and is forever making things. Oh. And he made awfully nice things. He made little steamboats that ran. He made sailboats that would go. And he had a lathe and spun little boxes and made brass trays. And he he was forever making interesting things in his shop. Early on in his life, before he 
Well, he, before he married my mother, he made a model aeroplane, which was sufficiently uh, worthwhile for him to be remembered in the archives of of, uh, the, of the airplane museums in this country. And when I was a child, in his workshop, there was a big one that he was building up in the peak of the workshop. But my mother wouldn't let him finish it. Said she, she said she didn't want a dead husband. She wanted a life. <laughs> So he's a very creative man. It sounds like both your parents were now brothers and sisters. You brothers mentioned there were there were six children all six together. Children, four girls and two boys. My older sister Sally uh, went to uh, after she graduated from Wellesley. She uh, went to Japan for a year and a half and taught school. Oh. And when she was over there, she she got scarlet fever. And when she came back very soon after she came back, she began to be deaf. And this had kind of a difficult effect in her life, but she finally ended up at the Pennsylvania Historical Society, oh. where she was for, oh, more than 20 years. So she had a good working life there, and she's uh, very good at all of that sort of yeah, stuff. She, are they, are they, she lives in Jamestown. She's Sally Smith. You may know her. She walks around. You know, she's awfully nice. Now, person. is her husband, did he She has no book? husband. Oh, okay. Oh, that's her brother, Edward Smith. That's my brother. See, the same one oh, as my father. Oh, the book okay. about the schooners. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. No, we went to a lecture at the James yes, Bond Historical wasn't he fun? Society. <laughs> He's such fun yes, and, and I didn't have any money with me that night, yeah. and I wanted that I book. wanted to buy the book. And so they gave me the book, and then I had trouble finding out where they were at, but I guess they finally got the money. Yeah, they're if moving not, to you know where I am. You know, they're building a house in oh. James Bond, not at Hulk Cove. Oh. So that's what Sally did, and Sally moved up here to Jamestown and about, uh, well, I guess she's been here six years. She must have come 78. Ooh, and then, okay. then comes myself. Then comes oh, my... Oh, so you're the second oldest, I'm the second. yeah, right. Okay. And my sister Anne died very tragically of a brain tumor when she was 29, so she Ooh. went out of the family. And then comes my brother Bill, who also, William Wharton Smith, and you see that connects him with the Wharton family, mm -hmm. connects us with the Wharton family. Uh, he also worked for the XI Battery Company all his life and was in this development and design. Mm -hmm. and, and where is he now? He is in Philadelphia still. Then I have a, another sister, Mrs. Lutman, yeah. who uh, was married to an eye surgeon and finally divorced him and moved up to Newport. And she uh, works for the Jamestown Garden Club. And then she paints a lot. Yes. She's oh, she. Yes, yes, I have seen lovely things. And her daughter, isn't her daughter do wonderful her uh, daughter knitting does work? Wonderful knitting and yes. work with her hands. Her daughter is so gifted. So gifted. Works at Mystic, the Mystic Seaport. Mm. And then my younger brother Ned Edward Ju Junior one. And I can't tell you what the name of his factory was, but he worked in a factory in Stamford. Several different ones. I, I can't tell you they're too complicated. <laughs> okay. But he and his wife, he retired two years ago, and he's, they're building a house out at Hull Cove. And his wife was the daughter of Stanley Woodward, a painter from Rockport, Massachusetts, who was very well known oh. in his day. So that's all my generation. Well, I must say it sounds like a very interesting <laughs> life for all of you. Now, is um, this where you want me to tell you, to, me to tell you what I did? Oh, that, well... Um, not yet. Not yet, no. Okay, fine. Um, but I, I'm curious at this point, yes. um, your association with Newport and right. How, right. how you got here. The house how next you, door to mine, 64 Washington Street, has been lived in by my father's ancestors since 1759. Mm. And in 1759, when Thomas Robinson bought that house... Uh, and then during the Re Revolution, the Vicomte de, de Noailles was stationed in that house. Uh, one of the officers in the French Revolution stayed there. And uh, Thomas Robinson's wife was Sarah Richardson, who was the daughter of the, uh, one of our wonderful Newport men, Thomas Richardson. Anyway, the family went on, and finally, the daughter who was in that house in the Revolution, was in love with an English captain. You know, the English were quartered here for three years. Yes. And uh, her mother sent her over to stay with her uncle in South County, 
an, another Robinson, and poor Molly Robinson couldn't see her English lover. And he went off to war, and he was killed in the Battle of Yorktown. Mm-hmm. And it took her some years to... Now, did the family uh, to, send her over there to for her safety? Either? No, so right. she wouldn't get entangled any more deeply with Captain okay. Parkin. His name was. But uh, she finally married a Philadelphia Quaker who was a good deal older than she was. And, of course, he came up here to Newport to the yearly meeting. As yes. you may know, uh, one of the biggest, not just spiritual events, but social events in Quaker lives, was traveling around to the different meetings. And so uh, a lot of Philadelphia Quakers came up here to Newport. Right, yes. Just because we have had the great yearly meeting here, you know. Yeah. And that's how, how uh, John Morton met Molly. And she, and she married him and went down to Philadelphia, and she had her family down there. But uh, in the meantime, Robinsons were here. And eventually, Molly's grandson, Benjamin R. Smith, inherited that house in about 1760, and he, he had it done 1760? over. 1760? No, no, 1860. 1860, okay. Um, he uh, had it done over, and interestingly enough, the man who uh, worked on it for him was Charles Fallon McKim, of oh. the, uh, before he was in the, in the architectural firm. And so the, the room which had been the great fireplace room, with a huge fireplace, McKim made into a parlor, and it's very Remember interesting. Remember that walking tour we took uh, the, uh, with the architectural historian? Yes. And that, Did you and, go in there? No, oh, no, we didn't go in, but uh, we walked around outside, and this was given as a, you know, as a, an example. Uh, as an example it's of, yes. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful inside. They've had enough money to keep it up, and they've yeah. done it beautifully. So that's how it all happened. And then you see my father, who grew up, came here every summer, a long summer it was, too. Uh, loved this house. And he always loved but that this house. But this house, this yeah, house, okay. my grandfather owned. He had to buy all three other corners of the street to protect his house. He owned the the Dennis house and the the lot Ooh, where the church was. Yes, he owned that before. But he, um, they were threatening a great commercial pier to go right out here. Oh. Now, when you say out here, can you uh, my my house right about where okay. I'm pointing? All right, it's about in the middle of my yard. And in order to protect his property, grandfather bought this house and bought the Victorian house to save his house. And then this was rented all a lot for a long time. Yeah, now, what, did, what year would that have been, approximately? Well, I, I really can't tell you the year. I have no idea what the year okay. was, but when it was. But um, he rented this one, too. That was rented out mm-hmm. to the, the a... Uh, the Society of Nuns connected to the Episcopal Church. The, the Episcopal Diocese bought the land, I don't know whether it was the diocese or the church in Newport, bought the land there and put up St. John's Church. And then, when I was a tiny little girl, there were two wonderful old ladies living in the Dennis house. Their name was, were the Miss Ferris, Mrs. Ferris. And they had this great, big, wonderful music box. And we were allowed to dress up in our best clothes and go over and have tea in little cups and have Miss Ferris <laughs> play the music box for us. But then grand, my father, see, my grandfather had gone by this time. My father sold that house to the church, so that became a package of itself. Okay. And eventually, uh, he sold this one to the Sisters of the Holy Nativity. That okay. was their name. This is the house directly the, across yes, the, the street. Victorian one across the street. And the, the other street. one is, you're talking about, is the Kitty Corner one? Yes. And that's, uh, which is across from 64. Yeah. Yes, Washington. Okay. that's right. So that my father used to come up for the his two weeks vacation. He had two weeks of vacation. That's all he got from the Excise Company. And he came up for the two, first two weeks of September. And we all came with him and stayed with my grandmother. And of course, it was wonderful. We came up in the fall river boat. We took a train from Philadelphia oh, to but that's a whole section of York, questions. And oh, then that's we walked across Front Street and and got in the fall river boat. We always got off at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And grandmother would have a carriage down at the foot of the street. Uh, there were, of course, four of us, five of us, six of us, and they got us all organized, and the older children each had a younger one to watch out for, and the older child children each had a bag, <laughs> and the porter would come and knock on your doors when you went around Point Judith, and we were all waked up, staggering with sleep, and put our clothes on and got our little sister or brother, and went down and got off the boat. And grandmother would have a, I guess it's a carry-all, a wonderful carriage with a little uh, top on it and a fringe around the top. 
and we'd get into this carriage, and I have the recollection that the drive from Longmore to grandmother's house was miles long. You know, it's, <laughs> if I don't believe it's even a football field. <laughs> and at the doorway would stand a grandmother in a blue cotton crepe kimono with a candle. There were no lights in the Robinson house. There were only candles and oil lamps. And she'd have gingerbread and milk for us there on the table. And uh, we'd come in still so sleepy, and then we'd just pile into bed. And, and then the next morning was just like heaven. We'd wake up and look out the window, and there was the water, and there was the green grass, and there was our father's castle. It was, it was just perfectly beautiful. Of course, my, my father only wanted to be on the water. All his two weeks, he wanted to be on the water all the time. And so his, his three little girls who came first were in the cat boat very early on, and we went a lot in the boat. It's funny, with, with uh, four girls and two sons, my father never taught his daughters to sail the boat. We were the crew, and the boys learned to sail the uh -huh. boat. We were, we were good at being crew, you know, but he didn't teach us to sail. Isn't that funny? So that, and then finally, in the end, we, we uh, my father got rid of the tenants in this house, and we came up, this is after my grandmother had died. We got too much for my aunt. See, by that time, my aunt, Esther Morton Smith, was in that house. And this is how you'll see why my name, why I'm called Fisher. My grandmother was Esther Fisher. My aunt was Esther Morton. I had a first cousin, Esther Morton. And then they named me Esther Fisher. So they called me Fisher. <laughs> and I'm always called Fisher. That's what Jennifer uh, Tinges told Isn't me. Isn't that funny? Well, now, I'm, I'm a little confused yeah. about... Hey, can you tell me something about your grandparents? Did, did they live here year-round? No, they lived retired? in Philadelphia. They retired he, here? No, he, he had the kind of business which I don't think any of us comprehends. Where he could take the summer off, he was not a wealthy man. He had run a pharmaceutical wholesale business. And I don't know, but I think somehow in there he'd earned enough in the pharmaceutical business to uh, not have to work very hard or something like that. Yeah. We, we are very foggy on this, our family. Yeah. Well, now, what was his name? His name was Daniel, no, no, Benjamin R. Smith. Benjamin R. Smith. And how, did he live to a... Uh Yes, he did, but I can't tell you how old yeah. he was. Let's see if I can. He, he so must he have would... died. He died before World War I. It must have been uh, before 1908, before I was born, oh. somewhere in there. All right, but, yeah. but you have a lot of recollections of your grandmother? Of my grandmother, yes. Yeah. She, she died when I was five, and I remember her quite clearly. She, she was uh, very austere and more... more um, what's the other word on it? Wore black tight clothes with a very closely fitted and a little lace cap on her head. She was very pretty, but she was awfully gloomy. So now, what happened to the house, the house when they now, were not when they were in Philadelphia? It was closed up. Okay. You could close houses up then. There was now, a man who lived down the street who looked out for it. He just but it was never broken into. Now was yeah. he? Um, did you say he was the one, your grandfather was the one who inherited the house? He inherited or it was from the, no, he inherited it from two Robinson cousins. Their names weren't Robinson. They were two old old ladies who ran a boarding house there. One was named Ooh. Williams. I can't remember their names. But they, they kept the house when, after the original Robinsons died. They were Robinsons. And until grandfather inherited it. Well, you really need a chart to keep up. <laughs> I know, I do. do. <laughs> oh, that's I just do. fascinating. Um, we have a lot of wonderful letters that Molly Robinson wrote back to her family here in Newport. They're perfectly wonderful letters. There's one, see, little Ben, my grandfather, used to come up here and spend the summer with those two old cousins. And this is how we got to love the house, so. And we have one letter which says, the cousins are writing down to his mother. Little Ben has a friend who has made him a set of wooden tools. His name is Henry Goddard. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, I've heard, uh, oh, no, I, I don't know, it doesn't matter what I've heard. I'm interested in what your uh, opinion is as to why so many people from Philadelphia have come to the Newport and Jamestown. I think it's the Quakers. I think the Quakers brought them. 
course, this war. Now, what about became. the Navy? I've also heard that. Well, the uh, Navy the brought Navy. a lot of people, but not necessarily Philadelphia. But of course, <coughs> we had the great shipyard in Philadelphia at Camden, mm -hmm. and so that. If you're talking about Navy tie-ins, but but my my grandmother Esther Fisher Wharton Smith, who lived in that house every summer for a long time, would in the early days she had her mother come up. Her mother was Deborah Fisher Wharton. And Deborah Fisher Wharton was the mother of all of those Whartons in Jamestown. And in the beginning, they came here and stayed in boarding houses. No, she but then came because she came her to daughter, stay with her daughter. She because came her to daughter stay with had her daughter. married someone who, who was owned here. this house. Yes. And then they discovered. And they they came up and and yes, they discovered Jamestown, the island, Connecticut. And they they were both of them were wealthy men. Charles William Wharton and Joseph Wharton were both wealthy men. Now, and they bought her, vast amounts father? of land. Whose father? No, no. no she, who, who she was her? married to William Wharton. Oh, okay. And he died. William Wharton and Deborah Wharton, Deborah Fisher Wharton, were the ones who were the ancestors, the parents of all this great okay. Wharton clan. There were nine Wharton. It's no wonder and nobody can keep them straight. <laughs> but see, there's Rosamond Wharton is the, is the widow of one of them. And her father... Was not in the same generation as my father, not her father, her husband. Her husband, her husband was in a generation uh, uh, nearer to me. It was his father that was in my father's generation because of this huge Wharton family. My mother being down, my grandmother being down at the bottom, and Charles William being up near the top. So you see, the generations get so confusing when you had these big families. Uncles and aunts would be the same ages as, as grandchildren and nieces and nephews. So it's why there's such a confusion here. But that's why it happened. Then those men went over uh -huh. and bought these wonderful pieces of land and put up those great houses. And that brought a whole bunch of people up here. But I, I think, I don't really know why some of the other Philadelphia Quakers came up. I think it's kind of the Quakerism. The shoemakers were all Quakers. Mm -hmm. They came up to Jamestown. That's not part of my story. <laughs> no, maybe... Somebody else can yeah, tell you. Okay. Sally, my sister Sally might know more about this. Um, I want to go back to your childhood <laughs> now. And um, can you uh, tell me some of the things that your family did together? Let's let's. You mean here in Newport? Yeah, let's keep it to Newport. Well, we, sailed this... we went in the boat. A yeah, lot you mentioned of the boat. Okay. That was all. We we had these wonderful picnics, and uh, we. Now, make where would you go? On the we'd picnic? go to Hope Island. We'd go around Beaver Tail to the Bonnet. Mm -hmm. We'd go to Lawton's Valley. We'd go to Prudence. We had a regular series of places we could go, depending on which way the wind was blowing. And it was really a lovely thing to do. We all got into this cat boat. This now, did your mother go too? Oh, yes. And my all the kids? went wearing a straw hat and knitting or sewing all the time. <laughs> oh, yes, all the kids. Yeah. I had one sister, the one who died of the brain tumor, who used to get seasick. She felt badly on the boat she didn't get seasick. So when she got older, she she didn't go on a lot of them because of this. And she eventually went to camp in the summer because she was miserable in the water. She may have had something to do with that tumor in her head, I don't yeah. know. But the, the uh, then when we when we began to live here all summer, see that's not oh, so we didn't far get back to that. Okay. Then we we went over to Second Beach to swim a lot. Now when did mm -hmm. you start coming here? Oh, nineteen twenty four. We came up one summer, the summer of, of the, the polio summer. There was a summer there, it's something like 1917 or 1918. There was a terrible epidemic of polio in the eastern seaboard. And so my father didn't want us at home down in New Jersey, which was the place we went in the other part of the summer. He was afraid of our catching polio, and he, he got rid of the tenants in this house. And we stayed one summer in this house when we were still quite little. See, 19... 18, I was only 10, mm -hmm. and I remember that vaguely, but it wasn't until 1924 that we came up for the full summer, and from then on, and, and then oh. we, we were here from, from then on every summer for two and a half months anyway. Well, so that was heaven. It was wonderful. We had a wonderful time. That's how I met my husband, of course, coming here in Newport. But we had, we were, you know, a lot of girls who have a great deal of fun, and Mrs. Berry would come up with her sister, Mrs. Newell. See, they were our first cousins. And we lived in the third floor of this house. It was a girl's dormitory. And we just raised the dickens, I think. <laughs> we 
were such a bunch of lively girls. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Now, what, when you were here as a child in the summer, did you... Did you stick together with your My brothers old, and sisters, yes. or did we you didn't, meet we the really neighborhood didn't meet children? Very or? many people. We did meet the Belknap girls, and one summer we played with the Belknap girls, Avril and, and Amelia and uh, Rowan, who's still here. And we knew the McClouds. We knew Edith Ballinger Price very well. She she would was part of our life, though she went to uh, Matunic in the summer, so we didn't know her so very much, but we did know her. Well, we, we stuck together. It was only two weeks. It's only two weeks. That's a short So vacation. when you came for the whole summer beginning mm -hmm. in 1924, yeah. at that time you were? Eight from 14. Uh, I was 16. 16. Oh, so you yes. were? Yes. I remember that because I took my driver's license test here in a Model T Roadster, and I had to go down Thames Street, which was two-way traffic. I had to go down <laughs> Thames Street. That was the test they put you through, driving down Thames Street. <laughs> and you passed? Yes, I passed. I don't know how, but I did. Um, any other uh, recollections about what your family did together? Uh, well, my mother quite often used to... We used to go across the ferry and see some of our Horton cousins. Okay. Or my father would sail us over to uh, Mackerel Cove, to Horsehead, to call on on Mrs. Morris, that's Kit Wright's mother. Yes. And we, we used to go there always one visit per summer. Then my mother always took me, because I traveled better than my other sisters, she took me up to Providence to meet her Providence relations. Because although my mother was born in New Jersey, her family came from Providence. Her, her, her father worked in New Jersey. I see. So that she always took me up there, and we'd have to go by... Um, Praying to Fall River. And then I think it was a trolley that took us from Fall River to Providence. It was the most lengthy process. See, that's when I was really little, because it's before we had a car. Mm -hmm. I never thought of that before. And we, we'd go see some of her cousins that she was fond of up there. But we, did, we didn't do much up there. We had lots of things we did. We walked in the rocks. You know, you're forever yeah. walking on the rocks. We rode, rode in boats. Yes, all. What's I was going to ask what you like. What color is it? Blue. It's dark, it's dark blue. I don't think. I well, think Dad knows where it is. You'll have to ask him. Now, you mentioned going to Second Beach, yes. um, but you didn't say too much about it. Well, that. I'll tell you how we did that, and that's after 1924. We got to know Richard Berry and his family very quickly when we came up in 1924. And of course, Richard Berry was one of three boys. And with all of those girls up in the third floor, you know we had a lot of boys coming over here. And the Barrys came said, all was the time. Was that this, uh, this house? This house. Okay. See, this is 16, when we were in our teens. My sister Sally was 18. I was 16. My sister Anne was 14. My brother Bill was 12. You know, we went right straight down the line. So by that time, we were a, a bunch of loud teenagers. And uh, Richard Barry's father had a little bathhouse put up at Second Beach. There was nothing on Second Absolutely nothing. It was the most beautiful beach you ever saw. Uh, but at the St. George's Inn, there were something like three or four little individual bath houses, which were owned by people in Newport. That's all there were. And of course, uh, I don't know when the deal was made, because St. George's owned that end of the beach. But we, we used that bathhouse. The berries turned it over to us. And every single afternoon, we'd go over there for a swim. And we'd pick up my husband at the John Stevens shop, and we all go over there and have this lovely swim until the 1938 hurricane when it was blown away. Yes. All those bathhouses were blown right out. But that shows you the development of Second Beach didn't come until much later. But there was a time in there when automobiles went on the beach, and they hmm. really made a mess. Hmm. It was an awful mess then, before the city of uh, Middletown began to take it over. Um... Let's see, we've asked a question. We went to Quaker meeting. Oh. Okay. My father would, in Jamestown, my father would sail us over on Sunday morning to Quaker meeting oh, in the cat boat. Oh, yes. And we would have made a picnic. And then all of us little girls, we'd have to row the boat, that we anchored the cat boat out, and we rowed the little rowboat in, 
and we'd have to take our shoes and stockings off to get onto the shore. Then we'd walk up Weedon Lane barefoot. We'd put our shoes and stockings on when we got to the top of the hill. <laughs> and it always seemed to me as if my father was very careful to have us come a little bit late because he wanted us to be able to bear the silence for a half an hour, not an hour, when he thought it would be too much for us. So we came in a little late, and it wasn't so long. And we, we went there. For mo- now, why would you Sunday. go th- there? This was closed than... down. Oh. This was just a great arc of a building, which had a few recreation things in it. Yes. It was connected to, yeah. but it hadn't turned into anything yet. There was no meeting there. No meeting was held. So that was, that was great fun. See, then we'd come back and we'd have a picnic. But Taylor's Point was also simply beautiful. It was a lovely beach. And the sand went way, way, way out. Hmm. It, I don't know what happened to all of that sand. And we, we went there a lot and swam off the boat. See, that was an easy... You could do that in two or three hours. It wasn't a day's trip. And so we, we had a lot of fun over there. Did, were there any other relatives in this area? Now, you mentioned uh, Debbie. And well, Debbie was, Barry and her now sister. Now, what was Debbie's maiden name? Debbie's maiden name was Ross Massler. Okay. My mother's sister, Marjorie Atwater, married an Edward Ross Massler. So they came up and spent the summers with us often, or spent a month with us. And my grandmother, my grandmother Atwater, came up and would spend a month, month with us in the summertime. So, but this. Um, any uh, so were there any other? Uh, well, relatives? there were. Yes, I'll tell you who there were. My father had a much older sister, named Anna Wharton Smith, and she married a doctor Henry Austin Wood, from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He was a doctor. In fact, he was a very fine doctor. He made the first appendectomy operation in the Boston area. Mm. And he had a practice in Waltham, Massachusetts. And they had four children. And uh, they used to spend, when they were little, they spent the whole summer in that house with my, first my grandmother, and then they aunt, my aunt. And when we came, they had to get out. See, so they didn't <laughs> like it very much. But as soon as we got this house, then they could come. And we knew them well. There were four of them, two boys and two girls. And, of course, they were a lot older than we were because my Aunt Anna was much older than we were, than my father. Mm-hmm. But they were, we were very close to them. We knew them all. And, of course, it was one of them, Henry Austin Wood II, who inherited that house. So that house is now in the Wood family, and it's owned by Henry Austin Wood II's two children, who are in their 50s. <laughs> Their names are Henry Alton Wood III and Anna Wood Murray. So that's where that house is now. Whew, let me see. I cannot believe how you pull all these names uh, and dates and places. It's wonderful. Did, did anyone live with your family besides uh, your, the immediate family? No. Of course, we always had it. We always brought a cook and a second girl out with us. Until after, um, when did we start? Even when I, I was married, my mother still came up. She came up for a month in the summer, and she brought a cook with her so that I got a rest from cooking. But, um, no, we didn't bring anybody else up. But we had visitors, you know. Yeah. When, when this crowd of girls was here, we, sometimes we'd bring some boys up from Philadelphia and they'd stay here. But we didn't have anybody else. What, um... What kind of uh, future did your parents have in mind for you, do you think? Well, my father said he, he never sent his daughters to college to scrub floors. He came up once and found me scrubbing the floor. That's funny because in the springtime when, when Sally and I were at college and Anne was at college, uh, we opened the house. We had a wonderful time. We'd come down in June after exams. Now, where were, Sally, where were you Sally and I were at Wellesley and Anne was at Mount Holyoke. And Sally and I would drive down. By that time, we had a Model A Ford. And, and we'd drive down into this house, and we would scrub it from top to toe. We'd, we'd, we'd put all the mattresses out in the lawn to sun, and we opened all the windows, and, and all, we just did everything and got it all ready. And then my parents would come up 
And that, so we did, we were used to scrubbing this house. <laughs> but that's a little different than my father having me marry somebody. But, you know, it, it was hard for my parents' generation to accept the changes that happened. As a result of what? Do you know why suddenly there were no people to help you in the houses? You had to do it all yourself. And, of course, that happens now everywhere. We sure. don't think anything about it. But this, this was a change. It wasn't a change in necessarily monetary status. It was a change in availability of people who were willing to be domestic. There wasn't that class in life That's anymore. Right. Now, when you have somebody clean their house, they're a professional. And, quite rightly, you pay a decent sum for it. They get a decent wage for it. I can't tell you any more than that. But okay. So your the children were expected to go to college? In yes, we all went to college. My father sent six children through college. Wow. I don't know how we did it. We did. We all went, yes. So you went to high school in... I went, we went, all went to a great big Quaker school in Philadelphia uh -huh. called the Germantown Friends School. We all went to it. And then we all went to college. And uh, we... We didn't come out. We weren't the kind that would come out in society. Was that because we weren't, we weren't of your that Quaker kind. background? Well, I would think partly. Yeah. I would think certainly partly, but also because uh, I think my father believed in women, women's intellect and women having a, you know, doing something. He he was disappointed that when Sally and I got out, why don't you close that curtain so you don't get such a draft on you? I'm not getting you don't a draft. Feel Are you uncomfortable? Oh, this is Sorry. a little. Co close the two ends of it. Yeah. First Sam opened one and then Oliver opened the other. He was disappointed when we got out of Wellesley that Sally and I were not prepared to work. And and Wellesley at that time you didn't, you didn't approach have you the that skills? way. You didn't have the skills? We had not to... taken the things in college which would have enabled us to work. The only one that really was available in Wellesley was teaching. Mm -hmm. And neither Sally nor I wanted to teach. But there was no counseling service or anything in Wellesley to say now, what, Miss Smith, what are you expecting to do after you get through? Are you going to, you know, prepare yourself to remember the There was nothing like that. And then, of course, Sally got out of college in 1930. I got out in 1931. And it was at the very depths of the Depression. And we were asked, the government asked you, if you can feed and clothe your children, do not take a job away from somebody who needs it. And we were not encouraged to get work. My sister Sally worked for a um, social service agency, but I didn't have any work. I went down to the Kentucky Mountains with the American Friends Service Committee, and I worked in the coal mines for two years. Oh, my gosh. I, I served... Um, lunch for the school children in Pike County, Kentucky for two winters. And of course for that I got my, my living in $25 a month. And it was a great life, let me tell you. <laughs> and then I got married. And uh, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that um, your family were Quakers. Were, did you, and you went to church regularly? My, my grandmother Atwater, although she was born and bred a Quaker, left Quakerism because she said it was so bigoted and so narrow and they didn't allow you to sing and play music. This was in the mid 1800s. She became a Unitarian. But my grandfather Atwater remained a Quaker and he was a very unusual Quaker. He was a very broad-minded, wonderful human being. One of the real prizes in my family was this grandfather. He he uh, had these nine children, and when he uh, he left the job in Millville, New Jersey, took his all of his children to Berlin, and he studied chemistry in Berlin. Hmm. And then he came back to the United States and worked for the Salve Process Company in Syracuse, New York, until he retired. So all his children learned to speak German. And then he, after he retired, he went to Paris and lived there for three years. Hmm. And his children went over and stayed with him. They were all grown, and they all learned to speak French. But you see, he had a very wide approach to life. He didn't take them over as dilettantes or as travelers. They went there to live in the context of the cities where they were, so that all of his children had a very diversified point of view on life. Well, fine, but grandfather always went to meetings. Now, my, my mother was a Unitarian. She couldn't stand to go to meetings 
and hear tiresome people talk. As you know, in Quaker meeting, anybody can speak. And she got very upset by tiresome speaking. She said she'd rather pay a good preacher any day. I know she was going to get something good. But my father, who also didn't go to meeting for a long time because he was so upset that so many of them didn't believe in evolution. Oh. And he, he wouldn't go. See, you have to trace this back to his college. Yeah. When he was a young man, he wouldn't go. But in his 40s, he went back to Quaker meeting and decided it was more important to be worshipping there together than fussing about the tiny little differences in people's thoughts, the little uh, dogmatic differences. And then my mother came with him, and we all went. So you see, we, it's as if having left Quakerism, we came back with a deeper devotion to it than some of the people who... Say in, all the in time. terms of the time sequence, when did you start going? To I must have started going. Well, it's somewhere around World War One, I, I would think. But somewhere around you World went War to I, Quaker uh, to a Quaker, Quaker school all my life. School all your life. Oh, yes. See, my father went to that school, and Quaker schools are are excellent mm -hmm. schools, and they have a very good reputation. Yeah. But uh, there would, wouldn't have been any... And, of course, we went to meeting in, in school. Thursday morning, you had Quaker meeting. And my aunt was there, and she used to... Uh, Esther Morton Smith. She always gave a nice sermon for the children. She'd get up and say something awfully nice, which was really uh, right where they could think and understand it. So you can see I had a lot of Quaker meeting in my With, with the uh, Quaker faith, how did one spend the, the Sabbath? Uh, By the time to the I meeting. was a Quaker, you, you were no longer a narrow-minded Quaker. Quakerism has allowed itself to grow, and I think it's very important. And it isn't a, Quakerism isn't a puritanical religion. It's a, it's a religion of love and light. It's not meant to be one of narrow backbiting, which some, some of them are. And so to be happy and, and praise the Lord by enjoying yeah. what he provides for you was one of the one of the things. And we were brought up, I think, happy children. We we were brought up with a sense of duty and all that sort of thing. And of course early on you go to Quaker school, you get all of that those the Quaker things which came up early in the twentieth century, which is the American Friends Service Committee. This is the devotion to works of mercy. And that's something mm -hmm. that's just grown up in the twentieth century. And we all almost all of us got somewhat involved in it. See my two years in the mountains and things like that. And it's, it's preached to you. It's in the very essence of Quakerism, is helping other people. It goes way back, way, way back. What about, uh, what about holidays? Are they holidays celebrated were just, differently, or no, were they uh, downplayed? No. Or? Well, when my father went to school, holidays were downplayed. Uh, they didn't have school on Christmas, but they have, had, it, had it just up to Christmas, because they said every day was the Lord's Day. Every day, mm -hmm. and that you should you should worship and and uh, behave yourself every day. So it uh, it is it was a little different, but by the time we were growing up, it, it wasn't. We were had the same same uh, holidays and everything as other people. Is there is there anything else while we're on the subject of religion that that you think might be? Uh Worth adding at this point. We can you can always stick it in later <laughs> if it comes up. But I, I don't really have any other questions. But your mm -hmm. descriptions are so wonderful. I don't want to miss anything. Uh, I I think the thing that's that is so uh, it's the habit of silence. The habit of, of worshiping in silence is is if you've done it all your life as I have and my sisters have, it means a great deal to you. I I suppose it's a sort of meditation. But, but this is the core of, of Quakerism, is worshiping in silence and, and, and feeling the Spirit working inside of you, and helping you. I, I don't know what else to say. That is what Quaker, Quakerism is all about. When, uh, when you would go to the Quaker Meeting House over mm -hmm. in Jamestown yeah. on Sundays, was that, uh, were there a lot of people there? Well, or? there must have been 10 or 15, but there weren't a, a lot. Yeah. And now, nowadays there may be eight or nine that go there regularly. And it's just open in the summer, right? Just open in the right. summer for all of those Philadelphia places. There's one be bench, you know, they're very narrow benches, 
There's one bench that you sit on, and on the back of the bench, the head of you is scratched in the wood. Mm. Whose stomach is grumbling? <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, maybe at, at this point we could get into how you met your husband. Well, I really met him at the Art Association. The Art Association in Newport was then run by two very dramatic women, Maud Howe Elliott, and also there was Helena Sturdivant, who was a painter, painting teacher, and they ran his ran the Art Association. And every summer they had a most summers they had a pageant to raise money to pay the coal bill and whatnot, you know. And that's how we met him, met John Howard Benson, and he taught etching up there and lithography. Mm. And he had he learned a lot there himself, and he also taught printing. He had a printing press. But he was this great big tall thing, six feet four, skinny, great big feet. He was called the boy with a big feet. <laughs> Very soon after we met him, he began coming over to the house, and he was one of our followers. We had this great group of followers. Now, how, what year was this? This would have been in 1924 okay. or after. See, when my husband yeah. was then 20, 23. And, and he would come over and we'd all, uh, he, he didn't have the John Stephen shop until 1927. That's when he bought the John Stephen yeah, shop. And that was a stone? The uh, stone cutting shop, okay. yes. So that he wasn't um, coming over after work then. But we would see him quite a lot. And I remember he used to ride a bicycle down here with those long legs, and he had a friend named Frank Donaldson who had long legs, and Frank would sit on the front of the bicycle, and my husband would be driving the bicycle, and they were the funniest sights you ever saw. They were both so tall and long-legged. <laughs> but he, we had lots of fun with him. But I think uh, less in those beginning years, until he bought the shop. See, he, he did all sorts of things in the summers. He went... Um, now, he was he a, a year-round person Yes, here? his family lived here. He was a year-round person. Okay. And he went to the Art Students League in New York in the oh, wintertime yeah. st to study. Uh -huh. And then he came back and had to work in the summers. One summer, uh, this is before I knew him, he was on the Fall River boat. He was a purser. And then he, d he did various things. But we didn't know him well until he got the shop and was permanent in the summer. Now, where was the shop? The shop okay. was on Thames Street. Okay. 29 Thames Street. But he, early on, began taking us into the old graveyards on the island. You know, Newport is filled with wonderful old graveyards. Yes, I know. And he took us into them and began talking to us about art, not just gravestones, art. He educated our whole family, and the, um, our, oh, the kids, in the field of art. We had a wonderful time with him. And he talked Greece and Rome and, and uh, Renaissance Italy, you know. And he, uh, twice in his life, he got a job in the summer uh, being the lecturer on the Olympia Tours, which was a ship that went around the Grecian Islands. And, mm -hmm. and he had a wonderful time mm -hmm. doing that. And then, of course, he'd, he'd come back and we'd hear all about it. But see, there, there were two summers he wasn't here. Anyway, that's how I met him. And he, uh, he went on lots of our picnics and went in our sails, and we swam and rode around here and had a lot of, lot of fun. And then when did you get married? We we got married in 1934. This See, was so after I'd, your two years in uh, Kentucky. In Kentucky. Yes. I'd had another year at home in Philadelphia after Kentucky. I worked in four or five, three or four um, community centers. I taught folk dancing. Ooh. I had a wonderful black friend who played the piano beautifully. She'd play all the tunes and I'd teach the kids in the community centers. Settlement houses, they were called them. I taught them folk dancing. So I did that for a year. And that's that spring, we got engaged. In June, we got engaged and got married in September. And then I, we moved up here. Now, where were, the, were you married in Philadelphia? Or? No, we were married out of that house. My aunt was away that summer. She was sick. So my father and mother came up to that house. And so I was married out of the ancestral house, which oh, was, of course, very nice. Yes. And my husband was a Roman Catholic, and we were married in St. Joseph's Parish House. And then we had a, just a small reception next door. And then we found out that summer before we got married, we found out that we could make an apartment in this house, which was on in, the north at 64. side. 64. This one. Oh, this on one. On the north side of the house, which was certainly picking the cold side. 
But it, it <laughs> ran better. It ran, it, you uh -huh. know, ran along. And there was a big servant's bedroom out in the back, which we could make into our bedroom. So we fixed it up, and we stayed there for, uh, oh, how many years? We, we, we were there until my father died, living in that uh, apartment. It was terribly cold. We uh, insulated it finally and got it some better. But I can remember the first year we were in that bedroom, the rug would flop, would raise up off the floor. <laughs> and, we, and, and the little bathroom, the water would freeze every night during the cold part of the winter. So we got absolutely used to getting hot cloths and putting them around the pipe. We never, we never had a broken pipe. Isn't that funny? You just get used to knowing how to, how to fast arrange these things. We had a great big uh, iron range, coal range. It was wonderful down in the cellar underneath the kitchen and that uh, underneath our bedroom. And that was wonderful. It supplied all our hot water. Remember when I told you how we'd come down to open the house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the kitchen range had been stuck in the old fireplace. The great big fireplace. Yes, right. Okay. And it was stuck in in the hot water boiler. And the first thing we girls would do would be to get that fire going. So we'd have hot water next morning. So all of us girls learned how to start a coal range. And I think back to myself, that's one of my great achievements. <laughs> that I knew how to start and run a coal range. And I did it, of course, in that cellar underneath our bedroom. And whenever I had anything to make, like a big stew or a, or a chowder, I'd make it down there. Or boiled lobsters, you know, because there was yeah. that wonderful heat. But in the 38 hurricane, that whole place was just, that, that range was just picked up and thrown around like this. You wouldn't believe it. Oh, that, we have a whole section of questions on that. So you've, so, really, so you've lived in Newport in full this time. House. Well, was, it wasn't full time two, for two winters. The winter of 19... Um, you were married in 34. I was married in 34. Let me see. Tom was born in 1936. My first son was born in 1936. And uh, the fall of 37 and the fall of 38, we went up to Providence and lived in an apartment up there while he organized the sculpture department at the Rhode Island School of Design. Ooh. And see, that takes us through... Then my, my next son was born in 1939. See, that's after that year. So Tom was born... Tom was born in 36. Yeah. And John was born in 1939. And... Uh, what about your third son while we're on? 43. Okay. Now, wait, there's something I've got to get in here. The summer of 38 was the hurricane. Right. And uh, we had a series of tragedies in my family. That was the year my sister Anne was found to have the brain tumor. And after the hurricane, my father came up to see the damage. And we took him and showed him all this damage to the property. Oh, the water had, the waves had broken on the back of the house. And they filled the cellar. And, and the, 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 sea, the pier was all battered. The seawall was battered. We, we lost great parts of the captain's walk. And of course, our damage wasn't as bad as some of the people's. The, the whole city pier was on our front lawn. Now, were you in Providence during no, the hurricane? No, we were right here. here, here. Tom and I were right that in the window. September 21st. Tom and I were right there. Mm -hmm. this, this is why we went up early that year to Providence. We went up, up about the 1st of October. We went right up to Providence. Because of the damage Otherwise, here? I didn't go until it got cool, you oh, see. I see, I see. It, it went on the weather, not on, yes, because of the damage. We moved right out. But my father came up and he looked at all this damage, and he he didn't express any distress or anything. Finally, he said, "I have something very sad to tell you. We found out that Anne has a brain tumor." And you see, the whole thing was thrown into a different perspective by the fact that my sister had had she had a brain operation that fall, and and then she she was had been married. She was married, and then she. Uh, Later on, had X-ray treatments on her head, but in about three years she died. Three Did years. Did she have any no, children? No. Yes. She died in 1939. And see, this was. Gosh, I haven't got my time right in here. Have I? Yes, that's right. We found out she had the brain tumor. I don't know whether I messed up in here or not. Anyway, then the next year, my father got a, had a cancer of the stomach very bad and he was operated on and he died and that 
the year after that, my aunt Esther Morton Smith had a cancer, and and she died. So there were three years when one member of the family mm. died of cancer, and so we had a very hard time there. And my mother didn't smile, didn't laugh for for two years. She didn't laugh for two years. And after that, you see, my father's will, I got the house. This As house. This house. Yeah. And my sister Sally and my mother would go over and they rented a little house from Mrs. Wright for two or three oh, years uh -huh. until they found the Hull Cove house. And then they bought the cottage at Hull Cove. And then they came up there every summer. So that's how my family got switched over to Jamestown and how I, I stayed in this one. Of course, my husband was terribly pleased to have this house. He'd always loved it. And he, he used to tell me I married you so I could get this house. <laughs> So you have been a, a full-time Newporter since 1934. Since 1934, mm -hmm. and you've always been in in this. Yes, in this. Yes, house. I have. Mm -hmm. So you you really. There uh, was one time when I, after my second child was born, I I had phlebitis, and in those years they didn't operate on you for, for phlebitis. You lay still and had an ice bag on the place where the inflammation was. So I was in a nursing home for three months, and my son Tom went down to Philadelphia, was taken care of by Mrs. Lutman. Hmm. And, and then when I could get up and walk and take care of the family, we rented a place, an apartment, up in Newport. And that's the only time. Oh, we, we rented one the next winter, too, because this was too cold. See, these are the two years before my father died. Oh, okay. See, when it was too cold for me to stay here, and he, he could go up to Providence by bus. These are all before 43, so these are, I, I can figure out the time for you, if the time, the dates are very important. No, I, it's just to get, get some kind of... A... Well, so for two winters, two winters we were in Providence, and two winters we had apartments we lived in. And then my father died, and, and uh, I got the house, and we, we, my mother helped us, and we made over, put in a new furnace, and made it over for our living quarters. And that has to be 40 and 41. I remember because we just got the, the, brat, the copper piping before the World War II said no people can buy copper piping. We just got it in time. And that was surely 41, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. See, and he died in 40, so that's the fall of 41 it was. In terms of, of this neighborhood here, yeah. which is the one that you've been associated mm -hmm. with all your life, um, have you seen... Can you talk about how it's changed or what your recollections were as a child and what it was like in terms of the neighbors? Yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the, the sisters that you yeah. visited and would get all dressed up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other recollections of, the, of people or events or, you know, from the, from the early days? Well, from the earliest days until restoration took, began to take hold in Newport. See, uh, Washington Street was a, a completely separate street and had these beautiful houses on it which people had taken care of. But, but back from the point was slums. From right straight up to Thames Street, it was all very poor, very poor housing, and the old, the colonial houses were made into cold water flats. They were, they were very poor, you know, uh, absentee ownership. Yeah. And people now, who didn't What did care. you call the point? The uh, point originally, by that I mean in the colonial period, this was a point of land which yes. was met by Long Wharf. Yes. See, and in between was a great cove, which right. is where the railroad tracks are. Right. And this is what was called the point. But now the point is from Washington Street up to Farewell Street and down Marlborough Street. That's the point. Up to the Navy Base. And that's what we call the point now the area, so that the children that came down to play in the water, because of course lots of children came down to play in the water, were the poor kids from up here. And we, we did know most of them, when we talked with them, when we swam with them, you know. But uh, it wasn't much more than that. We were, we were certainly on a talking basis with them. So I knew lots of families. I knew, a, I knew a Hackett family, and two of those brothers ended up soft alcoholics. It was terrible, poor things. And I knew a family named... Uh, lived right up in the little old house. Oh, maybe I'll think of their name in a minute. Was then there a, a sense of 
community spirit here that you were aware of as, as a child? Well, you were separate from no, 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 but the we, other areas we knew everybody in the old houses, yeah. of course. Yeah. We, though you see, we you go back to those two weeks, and we weren't here long yeah. enough. And you had there were so there were enough in the family to yes. uh, that you and then the have, cousins came. Yeah, but it wasn't until 1924 when we stayed the whole summer that we began knowing people. But we didn't mix too much into the Newport community when we were in those pageants for the art association and for. They also were for the Historical Society. We, we got to know some of the Newport people. And then, uh, I don't know what year, I think it's 1936, yes. Uh, they had things called, oh, it was long before that. They had Old Port, uh, Old Port Day here on the point, which was sometimes to raise money for the church, for the coal bill. And sometimes it was for the Historical Society. And two or three blocks here on Washington Street would be hedged off. And we had a whole lot of wonderful things that this, this Old Port Day provided. There would be children's dancing in one yard. One year we had uh, a sampler collection here in my house, mm -hmm. which we got from the Historical Society. There'd be a, a concert. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that we sold much. It wasn't really a selling fair. We had a parade. Everybody who lived in the houses wore costumes, and we'd have a parade up and down the street. Uh, the concert would be in um, the church. We'd have an organ concert. King Koval would give an organ concert. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there was a pageant. Anyway, we did that for years, and of course we met a lot of people. We knew the Koval children well. I should have brought them in earlier. We knew them the earliest, because they lived right in the Koval house up the street. And we knew all of them, Betty and King and Robert. And, and uh, so that we did mix with the street somewhat. We didn't. Uh, we had cousins who came down to stay with the McLeods, Providence cousins, and we saw them. This is by the time we were here after 1924. But we we didn't mix an awful lot with with uh, the city. Did you ever, did you visit other parts of the city? As do you remember when you were? Well, or did we you pretty much we, stay on the point and go to Jamestown? Well, we went to the we went to Second Beach. <laughs> We went a lot there. Yeah. We went to the Redwood Library. We did the marketing. We, all of us girls did the marketing. Now, where, where were the markets? We went to Eddie's Market down on Thames Street. And, of course, we bought fish. We went to the fish market. There was a fish market called Smith's Fish Market. And I had a boyfriend. He was a tutor on the avenue. And he used to call up on the telephone and he'd say, Is this Smith's Fish Market? Because, see, I was called Fisher. <laughs> Down there, and all of the 
crowded as it was. But, uh, the baby didn't seem to want to go there. I mean, the individuals didn't want to go there. So I know we had a family for a few months. He just kept on going to wherever he was stationed. He left his family here. He took himself to school here in Newport. It was so good. And they had started with the first grade. They were, they were here for 13 years. I see it. I bought chicken at the golf course. I bought chicken at Boston. That's the family here. Did you notice a big major influx uh, at the beginning of World War II? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mostly oh, yeah. in what area? Yeah. 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 What do you think of it? Oh, so the influx in the southeast. I would know more about that than I would the southeast. The southeast is that I heard from Rick. There's a big influx there. It's taken all over. The community every day is as far back as Jim Sucker. Yeah. 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 You think did you see the influx of people in the Pacific and everything that was good or bad for this story? Oh, good. Sure, oh, certainly good. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, said classic report, uh, we'd like to see uh, the Navy as it is today, in the colleges, in the, in the schools, uh, rather than the other type of Navy. Uh, they were not happy about the computer station. In fact, there was a movement on to have the uh, No, I don't mean that. Certainly, certainly in all the countries. Oh, uh, Governor Biden? No. Oh, the United Nations. United Nations. So there was a move to have the United Nations here. Mm -hmm. Oh, they thought that would be just wonderful. Because that would be a different class of people. Because you have that uh, uh, class in the store. Was your life pretty disrupted by World War II? Mm, I don't think so. It was disrupted in, in the sense that uh, we didn't have a man coming home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, going to work at 6 30 in the morning. We had a man on night off all night for two weeks. And we only saw him. Nine o'clock in the morning for an hour. I was having his breakfast. Then he was in bed. I don't decide to go to bed in the evening. And that he had great difficulty sleeping. He had the door but had a sign on the wall with it. Resting. He was trying to keep people up to the bell or something like that. So it was pretty to see him social life that way. Going on in the evening, the person was working, and the person didn't always attend those things. Was it black out at that time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Light switch, or your light oh, switch. Yeah. So any kind of a light, the doorbell would ring, so there's one light showing. It'd be just a little bit of a glimmer. Oh, there would be neighborhood watches? Neighborhood watches, yes. Yeah. And of course, they had neighborhood. Uh, Groups too, in case of disaster. Oh. What did they do? Well, in case of disaster, they, they trained them what to do. Somebody with a broken arm, a broken leg, they take up a split, they sell up a wood. They would buy a house for us and use for one of the disaster groups. Uh, rationing at that time. Oh, that's a piece. Couldn't have all the butter you wanted. You couldn't have all the meat you wanted. You had a, you had a car, gas. And there's a lot of black markets here. Well, I don't know about Newport, but I know I've heard of many people. Yeah. 
butter and meat. Right? Butter and meat, yeah. The two things that stood out. I know my last ever entry was in the family. She used to give me bread, thoughts. And I was always a little guilty. Really. I thought we were pretty well fed. Do you uh, did you notice at that time how war related industries or jobs seemed to affect other jobs? Did some jobs suffer because we're Oh war? yes, because of the <coughs> the pay was much better. The pay was much better. When uh, the Sarpen station in nineteen seventeen and eighteen began to employ women war workers. There was a great uproar in stores in Houston where they were probably paying ten dollars a week or something like that. And by going over the fish for thirty days, seventeen dollars a week. And so that's when they were really going over it. Uh, I have some place in the house a list of names of the stores in Newport that they get and did the same thing happen in World War II? Well, no, but they had gotten used to it by that time. The First World War, that was a surprise to women to be able to do this. Did you notice some of the uh, jobs being affected in World War II? Some of the uh, military jobs taken away from other jobs? Going to the, uh, you know, like the fishing industry? Now, your husband went to work for a computer company. Yes. Before that, what was he doing for his son? No. He always went to Chuck E. Chase. No, he said no. Okay. My father was a carpenter. No, he went, he went to work at Chuck E. Chase when he was about 15 years old to learn the to learn machinist trade. <coughs> and he was a tool maker and then he was a supervisor. Did the concentration of uh, Navy military type of jobs here in World War II give people an uneasy feeling or more of a sense of security? How about security? And yes, security, but it was a place that the enemy would be interested in. A target, actually. Yeah, a target, yeah. Well, it was kind of a mixed feeling yeah. about it. You never knew when they went to the torpedo station. Two years ago, might have a bomb some night. Have any idea how much destruction would be done by that? I think somehow you you didn't let it play with you too much on your mind, but you knew in the back of your mind the possibility. So they did have an uh, explosion over there. Yeah, I think you didn't notice it. January 26th, pretty bad, pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you know anything about Not personally, but I do know. They would do all good for me. I can't remember it. January 26th, I can't remember the date. I were you or any members of your family uh, active in volunteer work with the Red Cross or USA? I did a little bit. They just stand and drink and have fun for a year. Tell me about that. How did that work? Well, they had the <coughs> girls down there afternoon and evening. You go downtown and see them? Yeah. Where was it? The fire station, I think, on and then some of them, some people did something too. But the night for us, yeah. I went to the bathroom. Uh, and it was a place that they stayed with it. They could eat it all night. How would you make them? Would they give you the raw material and you would uh, cut them? People used to donate the material. Uh, old sheets. You know, they put them. You cut them up and they're cut them up and they're cut. 
Thank you, Jeff. 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 Thank you,
had no business being there in the first place. He thinks he's in the But he never gave up that thought. He took it to his grave. But he had no business getting involved in Europe, Asia, or any place else. But our own little country, that's why. Well, people don't feel that way again, too, I think. <laughs> Uh, Newport in the, uh, in the jazz era. What do you call it that special like jazz festival? Well, I remember the first jazz festival. Yeah. Something you've never heard tell us before. And of course, it was rich people who put that up from R&R. And uh, <coughs> Frank and I went up to Bellevue Avenue. The first jazz festival was held in the casino. Not the theater so much, but they yeah. went in the front, the front door of the uh, uh, theater, like if you were going into tennis, up in the Bellevue Avenue. Mm -hmm. Went in there, and we stood across the street watching the people going in. Couldn't get over. Then they, of course, got white. Great, great many of them. I mean, all behaving themselves. And it was, it was held at, for several years. I never went to it, but it was very popular. A lot of people liked it. And so they had that riot there. And I tried today to think of what the riot was over. Whether it was party, or whether they couldn't get in, whether it was a question of tickets. They had tickets that they wouldn't let them in. I can't remember. Cause of the riot was. But uh, I can remember awakening and hearing all the bells. The riot bells, fire alarms, mm -hmm. and of course we were way out here awakening and saying something must be wrong somewhere in the city. And the police blocked off certain sections. In order to get out of Newport, you had to go a certain way. I forgot which way it was now. You had to like go down by the beach, down to Middle Town and around as well to get out. You could go back with the towel or something like that. It's a place blocked entirely. They said, Oh, everybody had to get out the same way. And then of course they didn't have us there after that. And they brought it out here to Festival Field. And of course we all wanted to help everything like, you know, this way to them. But we would go over the Calpus Road, and watch the people go down to it. Many of these are the strange and customers. If you did take part in this, you thought it was strange why you thought it was the strange of it. But that, that, that bothered us too with party down here. There was no place to park until they were right on top of us. There was people's driveway, or, or in front of the driveway, you know, and that then on one occasion, kids came over the hill, brought down the fence, and that was the end of the gas festival. Mm -hmm. and the children just got in the up now and then last couple of years, you can only get to the point at it when you're tired of just this day. How do you feel about that, burning it up again? Well, I, I don't mind any of People enjoy it. I don't, but somebody else does. Do you have any thoughts about how the city handled the uh, the street riot? Oh, I think they did it the right to have everybody get everybody go pouring through the city. By the time they got out around the country, they had cooled off. The departure of the fleet of the navy uh, in the early seventies. Uh, do you feel that the Departure of the Navy was a, a loss or a gain for Newport? Oh, I always felt it was a loss. I, uh, I still feel it was a loss not to have those two tiers uh, filled with, with Navy ships. Not, not filled with other ships, but Navy ships. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe they 
sometimes that's a lot of money for babies to bring up their their self possession. But uh, I felt that they were questionable a little bit. I like to see the maybe here. I know some people don't. I know it's very hard for some of the ladies to find places to live. Because it's not they not enough places to live for them to live by themselves. But I have always heard from many, many, many people that maybe families like to bring up their children here. Yeah. In what ways did you notice the city change after the police pulled out? Oh, but everybody was rearranged what was going to happen. And everybody we have to have tourists. Now we are here all the property with tourists. But this <laughs> It seems to have uh, been one thing that certainly has paid off well. Oh, it has paid off well, no doubt about that. Now, I'm, I'm amazed. You know, I've died in the bridges. I never did put that in any here. That was the bottom of the bridges, basically. And that was when they first opened. Bridges was the first one to open. Uh, 48 or 49. Uh, you were working at the that time? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it was a wonder of people coming to see it. Well, because they never came to the drones they do today. Yeah. And we thought it was just our something now and a couple of years from now to be all over. So I thought they had a bigger and bigger. And I was guiding in October. When if you had a good day, you have ten thousand for the whole, whole summer. They have that a week now, and so it was a rainy day. So we didn't see much hope of having our ten thousand. But uh, a bus load of waves came, and that pushed us over. And I had the tour, I had the ten thousand waves, and it every Great Hall, there used to be a dinner guy. It's been removed now. <clears throat> and I was always dying to hear what that sounded like. I think the sales were in charge of the whole thing. And I said, if you have 10,000, can I read the dinner guy? So I could. Well, everybody wants to read it. He said, no, I promise not. So uh, we rang the bell and called it. In the world, the break was at 10,000. They gave a big party to us that night for the general reception there. The Countess, the Shady, and the Warren, and Miss Brayton. Miss Brayton was from the Green Acres farm out there for the animals and all. You can see that up there. The Warren is there. I think it's there. Too. I'm not sure about that. And she said they gave us a party in the reception room. So we had the same time. And now, not only the breakers, all the palace is open. You know, all the houses have, have come in droves. Do you think that's good for you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, only this week, I took a, a ride in the harbor. I was over there at the causeway. On the, on the trip that I took, there must have been 50 people in Springfield. A busload. Hmm. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. One after the other, they came down the gate and all see the six of the store. But uh, there's something up in Springfield that's advertised. Mm-hmm. A ride of the, the harbor. Oh, I think, I think the tourism is good for Newport. Uh, it's just a little hard to get around. But, uh, oh, you can try it out of it. Um, did the pullout of the Navy fleet uh, affect you personally? No. My husband was retired by that time. The closing of the Papi District was affected. Because at that time, he had been there uh, 36 
He had to work on a machine for many, many years with his supervisor. And he was going to have to be in competition with the veterans coming home, the young people. Their eyes grew better for the machine than his, actually. And uh, uh, so the a great deal of feeling who was going to be bumped off and who wasn't. And at the same time, uh, I don't know. They would say, no more uh, layoffs. Absolutely, I would know if you were going to have a layoff. At 11 o'clock in the morning, they'd call out and say, so many are going. And, uh, same time for Francis and his book uh, Sullivan. The machines are retirement. Well, to me, he would have been retirement. Uh, I mean, he was still perfectly able to work. You know what I mean? He could have gone on for another 10 years, probably, as far as his health was concerned. That's how it uh, photos like this, they picked up for that. We lived just the same. Yeah. I went back teaching. Yeah. He wasn't too bitter about it? What? He wasn't too bitter about it? Or no, he felt very badly about it. It was not the thing that uh, he wanted to do with his life, anyhow. But he was more responsible for 15 years old. He had other ideas. Oh, really? And today, so many chances, political chances to get an appointment to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was more difficult to play Tamil music. Yeah. From either what you heard or what you saw, uh, could you describe a Friday night or Saturday night downtown in Newport that you could get down. I was never downtown in Newport. I was down here Saturday night. Just in the city of Newport. This was in our low place. <laughs> Did you hear some stories about what it was? Yeah, I. Main Street just had a pretty crowded bar. I know when my husband had his, did this, had a gas shirt that I went to meet my husband on the 4 to 11 ship. I used to go down and park the car on Penn Street. He knows I say Tim, but not Penn. Maybe I said Penn. And nobody ever bothered me. I never saw any drunks going along that would just knock on the window or anything. I stood there until the ship boat came over. Nobody ever bothered me. Thank you, Secretary. Yeah. I have a neighbor over here. Her husband had the same shift, and she used to park her car and throw the ship together. One night I put in her car, another night she put in mine. So I had to stay there. Nobody ever bothered her. I never saw any excitement down there at all. There's nothing that what it's like now. I went down there to find out. Well, the uh, Newport Bridge in the city. Do you ride the ferry very often? Oh, yeah. You mean the same time? He paid fifteen cents to the board. I mean, uh, if he didn't get off, he would go back and forth as many times as he wanted to get fifteen cents. He got off, he had to pay fifteen cents back on. And he used to go only one Sunday in the summer, get off, and have dinner on Bay Voyage. The man and woman who ran that then, he was a teacher in Rogers. He would go over early. 
sit on the piazza and have a drink and go forward into their crowd. And most of the people were from Philadelphia. Rich people from Philadelphia. Uh, you see, the rich people settled from Philadelphia settled in Jamestown. And so the New York rich people came to Newport. If you know this. Uh, and uh, some of the people had the same room year after year. could smile at them, they just took you down. But after you left, they were like, uh, who you were. They just, 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 a lot of coming on, a lot of things they do. And you don't come back until about a month or so or something? Oh, but in the summertime. In the summertime, not in the summertime. In the summertime, probably for almost every week or two. And of course, it was a new place. If you wait for that place, you'll find the cars way up Hill Street. And on the other side, coming back here, people have become tired of waiting and turned around and went up the problem and came back to the street. But the, the wait was so long. So they could always take a hit on the car and kind of stuff bumping them all would be a bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much for paying attention. I hope that you understand. Thank you. How do you feel about uh Another ferry to the Sunder Ferry. Um, we went over on the Jamestown Ferry and then went across to the Jamestown. I said, the Sunder Ferry, I never did that. But, and that got you over to the mainland and you could get connected to New York Springs. Do you recall any of the names of the ferries that you arrived in? Governor Carr was one. Carr is a very uh, restoration and redevelopment that uh, has hit Newport. Uh, when were you first aware that there was perhaps a need to start changing? Yeah. 
And that's God speaking. Then a baby in the room comes. Changing its color to a few drives around, up to down the side streets and spring sometimes. I'm surprised I'm like, Well, I suppose these people were they're dying off. Then it became too expensive for them to run. Servants were getting too much money. So you can have a service for very little money a day. Because the fourth hand might be seven. Some of those people get three dollars a month. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Were you aware of, were you, was there, there seemed to be an awareness back in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, of the historic nature of the human species? No. No. What about in the late 40s when they were looking at the greatness of the, the group of y'all who were interested in improving the, uh, the state of mind of the house? In the bench? Not of the renovated one of the old house. That was the house. The restoration project is just kind of on the last few years. Yeah, that's right. Did you have any friends or relatives who were involved in the um, renewal or renovation projects? Did you have any friends who were displaced? I was going to say that if you were trying to displace the federal government. Well, I, uh, I see
Oh, there wouldn't be the crowd you see today, of course. Always, I think, it would be the crowd. And without one. Okay. Without the coach that day. I'm disappointed with a foggy day, not much wind, so the race was postponed. We just stayed out there waiting, waiting, waiting for the fire to take over the cemetery. And then coming back in the dark, all those hundreds of ships. I wonder if uh, they ever got it off and I thought that was another one. We, we, we took the coast guard up a hill to the coast guard. Uh, very interesting. Maybe the third last. Oh, that was in the 30s. Probably when I was watching it. I figured it out before that. When I was watching it, it was in the 30s. Oh, maybe 3, 34, 35, something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, watch, just watch it. No, yes. Go down. We, my husband and I used to love to walk down the wall in the summertime. Go up and down the wall. Look at the ships. We got lovely yachts pulled up there. We would be having dinner aboard the yacht. We could go down those walls down to that like, gate structure to keep it from going down. But we could go down by Christie, right down to the, go down by, uh, Black Pearl, right down to the water, you know, they pack it down. I don't blame them. Who wants to have people sleeping in that when they have their dinner? You know. You could do that there. You could do it there, here. Now over to the, over the causeway down, you see it. This is private. So you can't walk along that, that deck to the night shop. That's it. Purpose, I mean, just that you wouldn't like people walking in out of your yard kicking it at you. Which American Cup series do you remember the best? Probably a good idea, though, that we lost this time. I don't you know, to my interest to bring it back again. Oh, bring back my interest. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, but you can't go on forever with it. Mm -hmm. Nobody can. You have to stop someplace and get back and uh, try that. Try to maybe you better have a better boat. Not to be so sure of yourself that you are saving the best for you. But there's something else you can learn. You can never teach all the world. Sure, you can never fail. That's why I know all my reasons are not. Thank you. I think we're going to try harder now and maybe develop new techniques. Not only in Australia, but we'll probably see one of them. And then Ithaca's still. Yeah. If you think about it, what do you think to be one of the, or some of the biggest contributions to the American of race of Well, I think uh, we had very good relationship with the Australians. Each race, the 
Yeah, yeah. I don't mean they wanted them to win, I don't mean that. But they liked them. I can remember one of the races, I'll tell you which one it was, I went down at the morning, the man got a restaurant. Another couple came in and we sat on a table, and they had an Australian dinner. And he had just come over, purposely to go to the ball of the breaker. He had just sold his business in Australia for six thousand dollars. And uh, he took it. And he went back to Australia the next day. Uh, <laughs> He had said to them, Oh, that you'll all be tomorrow night, and I'll pay for everything tomorrow night. He never thought of a guest. Now, what about the uh, negative effect of the country in terms of uh, detrimental effects? I don't know. I would say. I, I know it's a detrimental effect. Maybe it's more for them. Nervous have any effect on your neighbors or your view? Uh, I think I know that. Do they cut uh, things like that? Do you know what? Yes, it does. It's really enjoyed with us. Uh, seeing them go out. Seeing them come in, and that's friends of Castle Hill, where they cut it in Castle Hill. And so we went over there for eight races, and Ron Ball pulled over the road to Castle Hill those days. That's where they were over there, and we stood one day, and we said, you know, we stay there all day, ready for them to come back in the evening, walk on the rocks, you know. He's ready to go. Yes, there's nothing like that. Then after two years, got the hill was sold, and all those cottages are so expensive now. And very many sports TV, so they were something like three dollars, three hundred or three hundred fifty a year. And uh, you could have it all year too. You could go almost just a day a year, you know, if you wanted to. You know, it wasn't just the uh, fun for yourself. Any other questions? Uh, the man that owned it gave you a tunnel. All was allowed, all the uh, street corners, all the visitors could walk on the red ground to the upper very nice. You were a developer in Britain and going up there. It was open to it. You had each any case that you wanted to go to. One thing you specified. So, you have to stay as long as you like. You have to see this. Thank you.
taken out of the prison. And the other stories may be far more interesting than the story of the Hunter Keeper. My remarks are not included. I'll be here if my picture's in the field. <laughs> 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 <laughs>